Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC, hello and welcome, CC, hello and welcome, one, two, three, four, five, six, she sells seashells by the seashore, she sells seashells by the seashore, there we go, rolling. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 14. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, the Documentary Life Podcast, and the Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Speaking of building, networking, and connecting, Today, we're going to dive headlong into a process that so many documentary and independent narrative filmmakers alike have been entering into with ever-increasing numbers over the past decade, that of crowdfunding for your film. It's a process that I am not only passionate about, but know a little bit about myself having run two successful Kickstarter campaigns on two separate projects. Before we get into today's show, I wanted to come on and say that this episode was recorded five days ago. And so the next part that you are about to hear is now thankfully slightly old news. All charges against documentary filmmakers Lindsey Grazel and Carl Davis have been dropped, though this is not yet the case for filmmaker Dia Schlossberg. However, I decided not to completely re-record the opening because I believe what happened to these documentary filmmakers needs to be discussed. We are all still, maybe even more so now what with the recent U.S. election results, in murky and potentially very troublesome waters. So with that, let's get back to the program as it was originally recorded. I want to talk about something that you may or may not be aware of. It's something that's affecting some of our documentary brothers and sisters, not to mention a whole host of native peoples up in North Dakota, USA. I'm not going to get into the politics of what's happening in North Dakota with the oil pipeline and what's happening on native lands. I'll leave that up to you and your own research. What I want to briefly discuss with you here deals with the matter of the journalists and documentary filmmakers who have been covering the events over the past couple of months. In this past month alone, a number of them have been jailed and are being brought up on some extremely serious charges, including maximum prison sentences of 30 to 45 years for some, like Emmy Award-winning documentary filmmaker Dia Schlossberg or documentary now journalist Amy Goodman. A colleague of ours here in Portland, Oregon, Lindsey Grazel was one of those arrested alongside camera person Carl Davis, a gentleman who in the past I've personally worked alongside, while filming a climate activist who happens to be the chief subject of Grazel's current doc project, who had been taking part in the hashtag shut it down action to protest fossil fuels and express solidarity with those resisting the Dakota Access Pipeline. Now, just to give you an idea of the severity of charges that have been brought against Grazel, listen to this. Burglary, second degree, a class B felony. 10 years imprisonment, a fine of $20,000 or both. Criminal sabotage, also a class B felony. 10 years imprisonment, a fine of $20,000 or both. Assemblage of saboteurs, class B felony. 10 years imprisonment, a fine of $5,000 or both. Criminal trespass of second degree, A misdemeanor, 90 days imprisonment, a fine of $1,000 or both. Total maximum punishment, 30 years plus 90 days imprisonment, a fine of $46,000 or both. So yeah, we're talking pretty serious stuff. I was shooting with my good friend Brian Kimmel on a job in Mexico when Lindsay and Carl's arrests happened. Brian, who is regularly in contact with the both of them, was the first to let me know about the situation. 
Now, while it may hit somewhat close to me, I would argue that it hits close to home for all of us. We're all in this boat together, no? When one of our journalists or documentary brethren is affected, I would argue that we are all affected. And certainly when something like this happens. I mean, this could have been you or I, maybe covering a political event, a peaceful protest, or when a crime happens to be committed within the frame of our camera, when perhaps we didn't even know the crime happening at the time at all. Again, I don't want to get overly political here, but I have to wonder how on earth in the United States of America can you be arrested for filming an event like this? Does this not seem like an outright violation of the First Amendment? Does this not fly directly in the face of freedom of the press? Or is freedom of the press a right that is only now applicable to members of the media or film industry that don't belong to media conglomerates like CNN or Fox News or the BBC or Time Warner Cable? Because I know that a number of you have either been in similar situations or may perhaps find yourselves in sticky situations like this in the future, I recently reached out to Lindsay Grazel in hopes of getting her on the show to talk about you know, what to do when one is filming in a situation like this. Unfortunately, as you'll hear in the following letter, given the aforementioned legal issues, she's not only unable to come on the show anytime soon, but she isn't able to really comment on her case at all. So what I'll do is I will read the email reply as she wrote it. Hi, Chris. This sounds like a great idea, but not now. I am personally overwhelmed, and my legal team is advising me to keep my public statements short and concrete without commenting on the specifics to my case. I wouldn't be able to comment in any meaningful way on the specifics of my case, which is what you are really looking for. Once the dust settles, if charges are thrown out as I hope they will be, or after a trial, then I would be happy to come talk about the whole dang process, what I learned, what it means, etc. In the meantime, I do think it would be helpful to have the filmmaking community engage in these conversations while it's all going down. I just can't take part in those conversations in any meaningful way until there is some resolution. Sad, but true. I'm attaching a press release for you here, which you can use to help understand some specifics. I believe that court documents, police reports, etc. are a matter of public record, but I'm not sure how you would go about getting those documents yourself. It would probably entail a call into the Skagit County Courthouse. Thanks for your interest, Lindsay. And I will go ahead and, and I'll post that press release on the website. So if you go to documentarylife.com, you can read more information on this. I'm hopeful to have Lindsay here on the show in the future once things have been resolved. I imagine we'll have a lot to learn from her experiences, and I eagerly look forward to the day that she comes on the show. In the meantime, I'd like to get some dialogue going on the subject. If you or anyone you know has run into any trouble with the law while filming a person or event or whatever, I'd like to hear about it. I'd also like to hear from anyone who might be able to speak about the legal aspects surrounding these sorts of situations. So my email address is chris at barongfilms.com. That's chris at B-A-R-A-N-G-F-I-L-M-S.com. This is an important issue that I believe we should all be taking seriously. So as Lindsay mentioned in her email, let's all be engaging in these types of conversations. In the future, I'll look to have some guests who might be able to speak about this and other issues like this. Also, I'd encourage you to start checking out the Documentary Life website regularly, as from now on I'll be posting articles, thoughts, ideas on subjects like this that I believe will be helpful to the documentary filmmaking community. If you didn't already know, again, the website for the program is thedocumentarylife.com. The site contains all past shows as well as a blog that will have specific show notes pertaining to that week's particular show. Okay, now on to today's show, which was inspired by a recent meeting that I had with some friends and colleagues of mine. They're going to be shooting an original short film, and we're planning on raising the requisite funds through a crowdfunding campaign. They hadn't decided yet if it would be through Kickstarter or Indiegogo or wherever. They'd asked to get together with me to pick my brain on how to successfully put together such a campaign, since Steph and I had run two previous successful campaigns on two separate film projects in the past. It was an awesome meeting. It was great seeing those guys, and I was more than happy to help them in any way that I could. And more than that, during the meeting, I began to realize two things about myself. One, I have some valuable crowdfunding experience and knowledge that can directly help people, especially filmmakers. Two, I love talking about my Kickstarter experience. I know that probably sounds bizarre, but I'm telling you, and anyone who has gone through the intense couple of months of properly putting together a crowdfunding game plan can tell you this, 
it's the coolest feeling when you get to the finish line and realize that everything you've been working towards, well, it's going to happen. And not only that, but you now have a whole group of people that are also a part of making your thing happen. So today's episode is about crowdfunding, specifically with a platform like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, though I'll probably mostly speak of, of Kickstarter since it's the platform that I personally have had direct experience with. Two summers ago, my wife Steph and I set out for Long Beach, California as part of ongoing work on our current documentary project, Elvis of Cambodia, which I've mentioned more than a few times on this show. But while we were certainly planning on shooting some interviews and a little B-roll while down there, that wasn't really our primary goal for the five weeks that we were to be living down there. We decided that it'd be in the best interest of the film to have Long Beach, home of the largest Cambodian American population, be ground zero for our 30-day Kickstarter campaign. Our goal, 20K. And it was a bit of a go-for-broke situation since we were planning on using the monies to get us to Cambodia the following month to live and shoot for the next half year. Not to mention we'd already rented our home in Portland, Oregon, so didn't exactly have a place to go back to should we fail to reach our Kickstarter objective. Well, as most of you can probably already guess, we did manage to raise slightly over 20 grand and we'd be well on our way to Cambodia to commence filming on the project. Now, I kind of doubt that there are many of you out there who don't already know what Kickstarter or Indiegogo is. In fact, many of you may have already run campaigns yourselves, hopefully successful. But before we go any further, just in case there are any of you out there who don't really know what the heck I'm talking about, hi mom. Well, Kickstarter and Indiegogo are websites or platforms that will host a page for you in which you can run your own crowdfunding campaign. Crowdfunding is essentially an internet era means for you know, raising capital that will enable you to get a business or creative project off the ground. And what I'm about to share with you is not only going to be some directly easily applicable advice to help you run a successful Kickstarter or Indiegogo campaign, but I'm also about to spare you what could amount to be some very costly mistakes if you're not smart about a few things. The first thing I want to talk about is the importance of realizing the amount of time and work that it's going to take, which is probably way more than you or most people realize. If you think that you simply put up a page on Kickstarter and that the world will then come to you with dollars, hands over fist, well, then you might want to one, go to the doctor and get your head checked, or two, download this program so that you may listen to it every day, first thing in the morning and just before you go to bed for like the next week. Kidding. Sort of. You've got to realize and prepare yourself for what will amount to be a hell of a lot of work. To give you some idea, when Steph and I went down to Long Beach to base our Kickstarter campaign out of, we were basically working on the campaign from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day for 30 days. Yes, sure, we did some filming during that time. Yes, we had our five-month-old boy, Flynn, who needed to occasionally be fed, changed, consoled, coddled, but seriously... We easily spent the majority of waking hours for four weeks straight doing nothing else but driving the campaign to meet our Kickstarter goal of $20,000. When I first came up with the idea for the Documentary Life podcast, I was hoping to reach out and start connecting with other like-minded individuals and maybe create a community where doc filmmakers could learn from and get inspired by one another. And I wanted to have conversations that weren't just about the technical aspects of documentary filmmaking. I wanted to also be having discussions on what it meant to live the life of a creative, in our case, as doc filmmakers. And to my pleasant surprise and amazement, that is precisely what has happened with both the podcast and our community group. And now, we've expanded upon that idea with the release of Living Your Documentary Life, a program that breaks down the ways in which you can, through the creation of your art, live a sustainable, creative, and fulfilling documentary life. In Living Your Documentary Life, we remove the obstacles that you currently have in your life that are holding you back from making your documentary film, whether that be financial obligations, your immediate relationships, or your mindset and confidence in your abilities. You will gain perspective, build momentum, and create a lifestyle that serves you creating your best documentary filmmaking projects. If this sounds like the kind of doc life that you want to be leading, we'd love to help. Just head on over to thedocumentarylife.com slash your doc life and let's get you living and leading your best doc life today. So what I'd like to share with you now are a few things that you should and should not do when you're running, say, a Kickstarter or Indiegogo campaign. 
The number one thing that I'll mention here, I, I, I won't necessarily say the number one, but the first thing I'll mention, and maybe it, it is number one, is the use of social media. And if you're running a crowdfunding campaign, that inherently in itself suggests that you're going to be using social media as a means to get the word out about your film or project or you know, specifically about the crowdfunding campaign. Don't be shy. If you haven't before, now is the time to do it. In fact, the time, you know, if you can, months before you run this campaign is, is, is optimal, really. Facebook needs to become your friend. Twitter needs to become your brother. Instagram needs to have a lot of photos that, that are showcasing you working your butt off on the campaign, as well as other cool, funky photos with interesting quotes that people can pass on. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, YouTube, you should set up a YouTube channel that through there you want to base some of your videos that you'll be doing throughout the 30, 40, 50 days and, you know, put together your email list. Your email list can be very critical throughout this campaign as well. Again, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, email list. One of the things that I'll say, you know, one of the things that I would offer, uh, right up front, in terms of advice when using social media is, you know, I'd mentioned earlier the importance of photos. Photos and videos are going to be your biggest assets. Using quotes, uh, making graphics, anything that really would, would amount to something that could be a shareable item like photos and videos, it's totally key to the success of your campaign. Photos are an easy thing to get, but they're also easy to forget. Whenever you're working on the project, whether it's the Kickstarter campaign yourself, whether you're out doing some filming, whether you're making purchases of film gear, whether you're just um, out meeting potential uh, interview subjects, always be having someone, if not yourself, taking photos of you doing that and you engaging with people about the project because you will be surprised um, how many times you'll use those photos or the way in which you'll use in the way in which you will use those photos. We ran our campaigns um, as a 30-day campaign, and every day we were accessing you know, our archive of photos and videos to directly reach out to our audience, to encourage them to not only contribute to our campaign, but really just to, to bring up general awareness around the project to begin with. Something that you'll want to do is, is come up with one or two out-of-the-box ideas that will hopefully move people to share your campaign. Again, this whole idea of social media, it's all about sharing that information and getting information about the film and then about you know the campaign uh, uh, the crowdfunding campaign out to as many people as possible you have you, you'll obviously be starting with people like your friends colleagues your family it's those the thing is what you can't necessarily control is what happens after that well you can have plenty of input you can't necessarily control but you can have all kinds of input and that's what i'm going to talk to you about and that's what i'm going to encourage you to do is to get past the, to move to the next level beyond family beyond friends beyond colleagues you want them to be sharing you know to have shareables and shareables again are things like you know photographs maybe with a, a quote a filmmaker's quote um, a video of you maybe talking about the film or anything related to maybe your film has a cause. Maybe you're talking about the cause and the importance of that. These are things that you want to be getting out on social media so people can share that. The more, the more you increase the sharing, the more you increase the awareness. The more you increase the awareness of your film and campaign, the more likelihood you'll, you'll be able to move someone to eventually contribute in a financial sense to your campaign. To give you an example of an out-of-the-box idea that you're going to need to come up with during that 30-day campaign, Steph and I came up with this um, this idea probably somewhere in the second, early on in the second week of the campaign called the Cincy Summit Challenge. Now, you might remember a couple summers ago in August, there was the the efforts to raise awareness around ALS and it was through the hashtag ice bucket challenge where essentially they would record the pouring of an ice bucket over themselves and then that person would then on that video then basically call someone out else to do it and so it created this awareness through the viral video activity that ensued with the ice bucket challenge well 
I, you know, well, we did a similar thing for Elvis of Cambodia during our Kickstarter campaign when we came up with the hashtag Sinsi Samut challenge. Sinsi Samut is the name of the all famous singer that came out of Cambodia during that time, who's at the heart of what our film is about. And so we came up with this hashtag Sinsi Samut challenge, and we knew that we already had a large community of Cambodians and Cambodian refugees around the world that were using social media like crazy. And so basically what we did was, we set out this 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 Sinsi Samut challenge whereby someone would sing their favorite Sinsi Samut song and that they and at the end that they would call out a friend or family or what have you to also record a video of them singing their Sinsi Samut song. What happened really took me by surprise. It's the closest that I've ever been to this idea of a viral video. And this thing went around it went around everywhere around the world. And so it was super cool. If you look up hashtag Cincy Summit Challenge, you can see what I'm talking about. And that's the kind of idea that I'm that, that you want to try to come up with. One or two of those during your campaign can go a long way in getting the word out. And usually video is a great way to do that. Another thing that I want to make you aware of are the hidden costs of Kickstarter. And this is a really important one because often if you don't know you kind of you know you kind of dive into this process trying to raise say 10 grand and then what you end up with at the end of the 10 grand can be really disappointing it's important to know that kickstarter's fee right off the top is going to be 5% of the total funds raised on top of that you need to know that either paypal or amazon payments and i think kickstarter really does it through amazon payments at this point well, there's a payment processing fee additionally on top of that, which is 3% plus 20 cents per pledge. So it's important to realize that right off the top, you're looking at 10% that Kickstarter and Amazon payments is going to take off of what you make. Now, here's the other important thing to realize. The government is going to want their take as well. And, and as ludicrous as that sounds to some, and I understand that because the same applies to grants. And this was a rude awakening for us that grants count as income. Grants and Kickstarter and Indigo count, things like this count as taxable income. So you've got to keep that in mind that at the end of the year, you're going to need to be able to, um, you're, going to you're going to be responsible for paying taxes on this as income. So that's super important. So you must factor in these costs when figuring out the number that you want to raise. So when, when you come up with this number, say the 10,000 or the 20 or 30,000, whatever you're trying to raise, you need to know that of that amount, that a certain amount is going, that, that a certain amount are hidden costs, right? And so you've got to build that in as you budget what you think you might want to try to raise when you do your crowdfunding campaign. Here's the thing. That's unfortunately, it's not, those are not the only financial factors to consider. You also have to remember your Kickstarter rewards. Don't fool yourself. Whether it's a t-shirt or a DVD of the film, everyone wants their reward. Okay, Maybe not everyone. I have found that there are two camps of contributors to a, to a campaign like this. Those who just want to support what you're doing, and, then, and the reward is secondary, if anything. And two, they're doing it practically for the reward, which isn't as terrible or awful as that may initially sound. If you're raising money for your film, for example, people they'll naturally want to see it. So when a DVD is a reward, well, that kind of makes sense. But, but, but you must factor in the cost of these rewards. Too many people don't really realize how much the rewards will end up costing them. So when, you know, they're all excited to have made their 10, 10K goal on, on Kickstarter, after Kickstarter, Amazon, and taxes all take their cut, suddenly it becomes $6,500. And then after the rewards have all been made and then mailed out, don't forget, postage, suddenly that 6500 now has shriveled to 5000 So you've gone from raising 10 k but that's really 5000 of it is what goes to your film. This doesn't sound great, does it? So, so something that you can do and that we did that was super helpful for us was create a spreadsheet that basically details all these costs out, specifically with the rewards you want to make sure that you know you know what the costs of each reward is going to be including again postage so then when you factor in you know what the rewards are and you factor in the different tiers of rewards whether it's 25 50 or 100 or 500 contributions you want to know 
you want to know exactly in that spreadsheet what the costs are going to be. So actually, what when somebody contributes fifty dollars, well, after they after the DVD is made, after you know the artist has created the DVD cover, the DVD cover is made, the CD and the DVD are made. You know, after all that processing takes takes place, and then they're mailed out. Suddenly, that fifty dollars is really thirty nine dollars. Well, you need to know that. You really need to know that. And also, I will mention that you know as you create that budget, keep in mind. You, oh man, I can't encourage this enough. You've got to keep that money aside. Keep the rewards money aside. Don't go and spend that money because inevitably what will happen is you'll think, well, you know what? I need this for the film. I've got to get it shot and I'll, I'll use this and I'll pay for it later. And then it, inevitably what ends up happening is, you know, a year or two after your film is, is put together, people are knocking on your door asking for the rewards. And suddenly you need to come up with two grand that you didn't have just to get out the rewards that you owed people, you know, a while back. Now, those are the hidden costs of things like Kickstarter payments, Amazon payments, you know, your taxes and rewards. But I also want to talk a little bit about, you know, what you can do to help yourself when it comes to rewards. Again, this is an instance where being creative is going to go a long way. For Journey to Kathmandu, we put together a super attractive, eco-friendly DVD slash CD soundtrack combo. That was one of our rewards. For Elvis, we took, you know, the traditional Cambodian scarf, also known as a chroma, and made it into an Elvis of Cambodia scarf. And come up with cost-effective ways to do these rewards. Make deals with companies that may want to help you. Um, for instance, we made a deal with a Cambodian-American apparel maker, Silong Chun, who runs Red Scarf Revolution, who happens to be a big fan of the chief subject of our film, famous Cambodian singer Sun Si Simut. Silong designed and sold to us Elvis of Cambodia t-shirts at cost to use for our Kickstarter rewards. The company Plyworks, for example, a friend of mine did this when, when she ran her Kickstarter campaign. Plyworks made these really cool bamboo frames, and her campaign was for her own documentary film. And she took, you know, 8 by 10 stills and framed them in these really beautiful bamboo frames. And while Plyworks didn't contribute directly to her, her campaign, they helped in by offering again at cost these beautiful plyworks uh, frames that she could then um, use as a reward on her own Kickstarter campaign. That can save you a lot of money. Another thing that I want to talk to you about is the fact that you are the face of your film project, and so you should be the face of your campaign. Do not hide from your potential donors. Your donors want to know who you are. Often, people really want to support what you're doing, so they want to see you, right? And in fact, many times, I would argue that people are often supporting you more so than they're supporting, you know, your film project. Engage with your audience with consistent videos. This is something that we took advantage of throughout the Elvis of Cambodia crowdfunding campaign. In our emails, I was often talking directly to people through our videos. We were using videos certainly um, as a big part of our social uh, social media blitz. You know, again, post on social media, share with your email list, speak directly to people who have helped you. People like to be a part of something that others are also a part of, and that just builds and builds. Finally, I want to talk to you about the last day. Do not fret if you wake up on the last day of your campaign and you haven't made your goal. Statistics prove out, and this was certainly the case for us, that it is on this last day that you make a majority of your phones. To give you an example on the Elvis of Cambodia campaign, we woke up on our final day of the campaign and we had 13,000 raised of our 20K goal. Did we freak out? No. We, we had done enough research. We'd run a prior campaign. We knew that we were actually in a, a good place. And again, statistics can prove this out. And you can, you know, Google this when you do your own research for Kickstarter or crowdfunding campaigns. You'll see how the kind of how the money works out throughout the throughout the 30 or 45 day campaign that you're doing. Why is this the case? Well, there are a few different reasons. Um, one, there is that there are this group of people, potential donors, who will then become donors on that last day, who I like to refer to as lurkers. And what they do is, they're, these are friends, family, colleagues that have been aware of your campaign the entire time. They've received your emails. They've they've seen the social media. They've seen on Facebook. They've, they've seen on Twitter or on Instagram. They've been well aware of this for 30 days. They haven't jumped in. They've been kind of 
kind of waiting in the wings, right? A lot of people do this. They like to wait and kind of wait and see how things are going to pan out. People often aren't moved until the last minute when they suddenly realize that, you know, they don't want to see this person fail. They don't want to see you fail or your project or crowdfunding campaign fail, especially since they're a good, you know, a friend or a family or colleague that has been seeing this for 29 days. People on that last day have a really cool way of kind of taking that responsibility upon themselves suddenly. And, and suddenly the, sh- the massive sharing begins and they finally jump in and con- contribute themselves and they encourage their own friends and families to contribute to their project as well. So on this last day, one of the best things I can tell you is to clear the deck for that entire day. It's your time to reap the rewards after the 29 days of hustling and bustling. So sit back and watch it all happen. Okay, well, you can't exactly sit back and watch it, right? In fact, it is a critical day that you're going to be engaging and working your ass off. You still need to engage. And this is a hugely important component to your success to make that goal that you've been trying for 30 days to get to. You must be constantly engaging on this day with social media throughout the entire day. Every time someone contributes, no matter the amount, recognize them. Let the world know that Aunt Millie loves your film about goat herders in Nepal and wanted to contribute $20 to help pay for three nights for you to stay in a guest house. People love to hear these little anecdotes and there's something that often makes people want to jump in and also be a part of the success of a cause like this. So by all means, again, every time somebody contributes, let the world know. As I wrap up this segment on crowdfunding, I will mention one book that helped as we researched and then ran our campaign. And it was by an author, uh, John T. Trigonus is his name. It's spelled T-R-I-G-O-N-I-S. His book is Crowdfunding for Filmmakers, and I believe they recently released the second edition of it. Again, I'm not pushing this book. I'm not selling it at all. I'm just I'm just giving you another resource with which to to help you as you you form your crowdfunding campaign. Again, the book's called Crowdfunding for Filmmakers. The author's John T. Trigonus, and and you may even have seen him on social media. He's all over the place. That's the show. I hope that you enjoyed it, and I hope you've been able to glean some helpful hints as you consider putting together your own crowdfunding campaign, whether, again, it be via Kickstarter or Indiegogo or wherever. In fact, I'll mention briefly that these two platforms are by no means the only way to run a successful crowdfunding campaign. An earlier guest on this show, doc filmmaker Lydia B. Smith, raised over a couple of hundred grand running a campaign that had no attachment to Kickstarter or Indiegogo. She ran it entirely through her own website. If you haven't already listened to that show, you can go back into the podcast archives and listen to it in its entirety by going to www.documentarylife.com. In fact, it's also at the website you'll be able to check out some additional show notes that I've written up for this show. I'd encourage you to start regularly checking the website for this sort of thing. I'll often have articles related to a show's subject matter, or I might have some trailers for films or music links or special discount offers like the desktop documentaries, educational packages, and budget templates that only Documentary Life listeners can have access to, or any number of helpful resources that would accompany the podcast. I'll also definitely be posting updated information as it comes in on what's happening with Lindsey Grazel and Dia Schlossberg and their pending cases. So do come back to stay on top of those important goings on. One last thing that I'll mention is that our next show, which will be November's industry guest episode, I'll be speaking with arts consultant and writer Maury Warshawski. Maury Warshawski has spent the last 30 years consulting, facilitating, and writing in the nonprofit sector. His book, Shaking the Money Tree, The Art of Getting Grants and Donations for Film and Video Projects, is well known in the documentary film crowd. So I'm eager to pick Maury's brain and share that information with all of you. And I think it's going to dovetail pretty nicely with this episode that you've just listened to. So I'm excited to have that conversation with Maury for our next episode. Alrighty then. As always, so long. Thanks for listening and for sharing your own documentary lives. Until next time, I remain your host and documentary brother-in-arms, Chris G. Parkhurst. Cheers. Don't forget, if you're looking to live and lead a documentary life, you need to head over to thedocumentarylife.com slash yourdoclife and take a look at our Living Your Documentary Life program. We'll help you craft your lifestyle so that you are able to make the documentary films that you want to make and live the doc life you want to live.
Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.